Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good day. Trying to accommodate my welcome to everybody in the international time zones. My name is Herb and I'm an alcoholic and um, I'm going to <clears throat> make an effort to bring up my PowerPoint slides. And I'm, I'm giving you a little early warning here. I changed the set aside prayer. Where's the trumpet music? <laughs> I've changed the set aside prayer. And this, so this is my debut with a new set aside prayer. If it comes up and I'm going to, what you'll see is I substituted the word unmanageability for brokenness. I've been in meditation about it for probably a long time anyway. And I'm going to do a test run with you tonight, especially since we have finished step one. And I have stressed pretty consistently the importance of unmanageability as the spiritual malady, those bedevilments as the problem. And so I'm introducing the set aside prayer so that we're going to be using unmanageability for the balance of the year as the issue that we're proceeding with steps two through 12. I'm inviting you either out loud or in silence or not at all, or whatever it is you choose to do to commit to and express your commitment to an open mind and an open heart. Please join me. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps and you for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, we have begun to look at step two. I'm not going to go over the material that I went over last week. I... Hope it was helpful to go over each page, page 44 through page 53. Tonight I plan on unpacking pages 53 up through 55. But I'd like to give us the context of the highlights of what we were talking about last week in step two. I'm stressing that it's came to believe. That phrase signals to me and confirms my own experience, the validity of my own experience. I got sober in 1984, a gift I didn't work for, it was a gift. But when I received it, I was willing to support it. I did the steps on my own that first year. My sponsor heard my fifth step, but he gave me very little direction with how to do any of the steps. As a result of completing steps one through 12, in that very first year, 1984, nothing happened, meaning I did not change. 
obviously my life got better because I wasn't drinking. The inclination to drink and the actual drinking had completely ceased. I was not even interested. I never was tempted since February 21st, 1984. I can't explain it, but that's a story for a different day, a conversation for a different day. In 1988, four years later, I did the steps out of the book with a mechanic. I've told you that. I'm telling you again because it's so important to know that I blew by steps two and three because they didn't seem to have any relevance, even though the mechanic took me through chapter four. It didn't touch me. I had identical experience in three years later in going through the steps. Although I had a profound spiritual awakening that first time going through the steps with a step guide and the second time going through the steps with a step guide. I blew by steps two and three, chapter four, chapter five, without it ever touching me. Oh, interesting material. We discussed it at length, but it didn't touch me. There was no new consciousness. There was no awareness. I didn't know that, despite the fact I had Lots of awareness, lots of new knowledge, lots of new experience with most of the other steps. But in 1994, I went through at 10 years of sobriety for the third time with a man who gave me that set aside prayer. That's why it's so important to me, the structure of how I'm proceeding because, and and perhaps this context because it it really confirms that this is a process and it's not identical for any two people. The promise is a spiritual awakening and that's at the end of the steps, step 12. But the journey is very different, almost as different as your fingerprint, unique for you. But I want to confirm that it's a process and it takes time and you don't know when it's going to happen. And you don't even know that it's that it is happening when it's happening many of the times. And I prayed that set aside prayer, the one he gave me at that time. And I was introduced to the unmanageability the way I introduced it to you. It came directly from Joe Hawk. The bedevilments on page 52. The extraordinary description that led me to an experience on pages 60 to 62 as the exact nature of the unmanageability and the reason for the manifestation of the bedevilments in my behavior. And then he brought me to step two. I was ready because I'd had now a whole new experience and I had a whole new attitude about openness to a new experience. That had not occurred to me before. I relied on my traditional understanding that came from my Catholic upbringing, kindergarten all the way through postgraduate school, philosophy, psychology, theology. I had it a deep and broad knowledge. It was the very thing that prevented me from having an experience. I didn't know that until after I had the experience. The step two doesn't refer to God. Notice, I'm leaving it up here for that purpose. Came to believe as a process but it talks about power. It neutralizes. There's no religious connotation here. It's a power greater than ourselves, not necessarily outside ourselves, not necessarily other than ourselves. Pay attention to the words. Greater than ourselves. And of course, I've explained the balance of that phrase to you, restore us to sanity, because we understood now sanity from 
Bill's treatment in the first half of the first step with regard to obsession on page 37, Jim's story, sanity, insanity, has nothing to do with psychology or psychiatry. It has everything to do with obsession and a thought. Returned us to sanity means that we're not any longer going to be hijacked by the obsession. We may have the memory, we may have the feeling, we may have the thought, but we're not going to be hijacked by the obsession that takes us inevitably without any choice and without our ability to prevent it and no human power can protect us back to our addiction. We live in a spiritual shield when we're restored to sanity. Now that doesn't happen until the 10th step, when we finish the ninth step. That's why I came to believe is a process. It may not happen here in step two, but it's guaranteed to happen by the end of the ninth step. And the words that Bill uses is placed in a position of neutrality at the end of ninth step. Well, now it's up to us in step two to get clear for ourselves. What do we mean by power? Is God necessary? That word. Many of you have been seriously challenged by the G-O-D word existentially, emotionally, mentally, in terms of the history of your own life with your family or with your religious tradition. That's why I, I believe it was brilliant on Bill's part to name the chapter to discuss step two, we agnostics. It couldn't get any clearer. It's inviting us who doubt. It's inviting us who actually don't even believe. It's inviting us who actually have a resistance to consider. Well, who are we as a human being? And of course, I've come from this model, which I will continue to repeat throughout our entire year, because it gives us an understanding of step one. I hope that helped you understanding that we as human beings are a body and a mind and, a, and we have free will and that those are corrupt in us. Every one of those three parts is corrupt, defective, but that's what makes us specifically human is that we have a mind and a will and those are the components for us of what makes us specifically human. Well, what do we mean when we say that we're human? Who am I? I'm a finite, meaning I was born and I will die. That's what finite means, a beginning and an end. There's a, parent, there's a wonderful book called A Parentheses in Eternity. It's worthwhile reading. Goldstein. He was a mystic from the 30s who wrote many books, but that's the one I've read. I've read more than one of his, and but that's the only one I really like. A parenthesis in eternity. We're finite. We have a beginning and we have an end. We are material beings. Obviously, like a carrot, we have a body and we have a brainstem to exercise that, to manage it. We have emotions and a mind to think. They're different. Our emotions are managed by our limbic system, that second brain. Our ability to think is in the cortex, that top brain, the third brain. The ability to know and to be reflective about that, we know that we know. And the other function that makes us specifically human is that we have a will. That function, it's not a place, it's not an organ. We could not have a willectomy. 
it's a function in us to decide. It gives us the, cap the capacity to decide. No other sentient being has a reflective mind. No other sentient being has a free will. That's what makes us specifically human. And as we explored at depth in the first step, our mind is defective. It's subject to being hijacked by an obsession and our will is defective. It's vulnerable to the choice about myself. And in fact, without outside intervention, I will always choose myself. Selfishness, self-centeredness. I'm a finite created spirit. And you've heard the term I'm sure in your meetings or read it in poetry or a book or heard it from a speaker. The question, am I a human being seeking a spiritual experience or am I a spiritual being seeking a human experience? That's a serious question. It's a wonderful question. It's a mind bending question in some respects. And after a considerable period of time reflecting on that in my meditation, my answer to the question, am I a human being seeking a spiritual experience or am I a spiritual being seeking a human experience? My answer was yes. And yes, I do mean to be kind of cute with that. I mean, I, I, I mean to get your attention. Yes, absolutely. The answer is yes, it's like a coin. One side is the human and the other side is the spirit and it's integrated so that it's all one. There's no real distinction, it's all one. This is of course my assumptions, my philosophy, my thoughts about this as we enter into step two, looking at page 47 realizing that step two is a decision about power. My concept, it's a faith decision. Bill says willingness is the key on page 47, doesn't he? Willingness is the key. It's the, it's the key to the spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom. My concept. Well, I gave you a fairly complex discussion last week of my approach to faith. I see that as a process. On page 53, after much discussion, commentary, poetry and prose, salesmanship and cajoling, science and art form in the material 47 to 53, Bill says God is or God isn't, what is your choice? This changed my life. The discernment that I'm about to share with you, that I shared with you last week, that I'll recap today, not going into the same depth and knowledge and explanation of it, but to recap so that perhaps tonight it might have a little broader meaning, a little deeper meaning to you. This changed my entire approach to meditation. This changed my entire approach to the spirit. This changed my entire approach to steps two and three. At 10 years of sobriety, the curtain parted and the light appeared for the very first time based on this model here and the experience that I shared last week that I'll recap today. Well, what is faith? On that page 53, Bill says God is or God isn't. What is our choice? we are confronted with the question of faith. And I confronted myself using that model that I talked about as a human being. Is it a function of the mind? This model had given me a powerful experience with step one. So now I'm using the same model to approach step two. No, faith by everybody's definition doesn't have anything to do with the mind. It's not a thought. It's not certitude. It's not objective. It's not science. Faith, by definition, is the opposite of all of that. All right, well, is it a feeling, emotion coming from the limbic system? 
No, even common sense tells us that could not possibly be faith because feelings are transient. And faith, if in fact we have it, is the stability that allows us to live our lives. Faith in electricity, faith in red light, green light, faith in the laws of the land, faith in you figure out what blank you want to fill in. But what is it? We don't know. And, and the dictionaries were not helpful to me. Oh, there's a wonderful definition by Father Rohr and some other dictionaries that implied the same thing this Richard Rohr does. And that is, faith is the acceptance of that for which there is no evidence. That's really clear. Faith is the acceptance of that for which there is no evidence. And so I said, okay, Bill began to introduce us to this process of faith as a decision. On page 47, a decision to be willing. He said, that's the cornerstone, an act of my free will. It's not a decision about addiction, and it's not a decision about my will or spiritual malady. It's a decision that Bill lays out so simply in black and white on page 53. God is or God isn't. What is my choice? Power is or power isn't. What is my choice? Those are synonyms. The capital P in step two designates that that's a synonym for the God word. It doesn't matter what word we use, and we'll explain. We'll have more conversation about that in a minute. God is or God isn't, what is your choice? Well, of course, once I make that decision, God is, my mind says it's pretty reasonable, given that if there is no power other than my power, which hasn't worked for me all my entire life, if there is no power other than my power, there's no solution to my alcohol problem and or my life and reality problems. So my mind's going to accept that. And that's my belief. That's my definition now of faith is the act of will to make a decision, a choice. That's my definition of belief, to accept that decision as my reality. I don't have any evidence for it. I don't have any feeling for it. I don't need any support on that from anybody outside of myself because it's all inside of myself. It's my belief, and I'm going to believe that. Now, I choose that, and that's what Rohr says. Faith is the acceptance of that for which there is no evidence. And once we accept it, the evidence appears. Brilliant. Because I made that decision, I accepted it, and then I acted as if it's true, and that's my trust. I put my body into the action of my belief and my act of faith, that's called trust. I operate as if it's true. I sit in meditation with no knowledge, with no certitude, with no feeling, with no emotion. But I made a decision that God exists. Bill adds in that section on page 53, God is everything or God is nothing. That's another decision that we'll be talking about here in just a minute. And I operate on a daily basis as if there are spiritual principles that emanate from this decision. Spiritual principles of honesty and integrity and fidelity and simplicity. Just, I could list an, a, a lot of principles, common sense to most everybody, that decent human beings live their lives by. 
Bill says, practice these principles in all our affairs. After step 12 in the way of life document, I have a list of principles, a description of the principles, the actions that are implied, the name of the principle that's connected to each one of the steps. That might be a worthy source of meditation for you if you choose to take a look at that and maybe take a principle a day or a principle of week and, and ask yourself, is it true for you that that's a principle, a universal human or spiritual principle, whatever you want to call it? And how does it, how does it impact or what are the implications for my life? A principle like gravity. That's a physical law. If you transgress a physical law of gravity, you will die. Quite frankly, if you transgress a spiritual law, a universal law, the human law, the principle of humanity, if you transgress those principles, you will suffer and they will crush you. That's the source of our suffering, the transgression of principles. This is not an academic exercise that I'm exposing to you right now. This is an existential exercise. Your very existence and your certainly your abstinence and sobriety are dependent on it. Step two is a decision. But here's the key. It's a decision about my concept. What is my concept? I'll be asking you to do the next assignment here in a minute. And the final piece of that assignment is for you to develop your concept. What do you need and what do you want as a power other than yourself, greater than yourself? What do you need? What do you want? It's going to be the final question that I'll be giving you at the end of this time we're together tonight to, to discern about, make some notes about, and come to a decision by next week so that we can have a conversation about that. I mentioned and I gave that picture, that metaphor of the organismic life force. What makes an acorn into an oak tree? What cracks the acorn open to become a sapling oak tree? Like that sapling there illustrated. What is the organismic life force? that directs then the growth of that. Well, we know that flowers be produce seeds to produce other flowers, don't we? I'm, I'm in a poetic mode now. I'm into metaphor now. I'm into some attempt to give you some concepts for the development of your concept of power greater than yourself. Follow the spirit of what it is I'm now going to unpack for you. A flower produces seeds to produce more flowers. A cat produces kittens to produce more cats. A human produces babies to populate the human race. Perhaps if there is a creator Genesis as poetry is correct in reality. Genesis, the author comments, God made humans in God's image and likeness. God made them male and female. These are just thoughts. These are just questions. These are just poetic illustrations to try to give us a sense of what is this? 
concept. What is this reality that we're talking about, this power that is greater than myself? This is about consciousness. I'm appealing to your mind now. We've appealed to your will through the big book on page 53. Now I'm going to appeal to your mind as a discerning mechanism to think about for in your consciousness, to challenge your unconscious, that mask that we wear that we don't know that we wear, that was created by our survival efforts, instincts gone awry, calls Bill Wilson. Step four will unpack that unconscious so that we'll have the true self revealed. Notice we're peeling it back, we're peeling it back, and we're going to get to the essence of image and likeness, my true self. Father Keating, one of my teachers, is a Trappist, was a Trappist monk, he died about three years ago. He talks about the core of goodness. Am I a human being seeking a spiritual experience? Am I a spiritual being seeking a human experience? What is the nature of this core of goodness? What is this nature of the true self? What is this nature of an image and likeness? This is not the words and the logic and the syllogism of the big book. But I'm trying to help you unpack what's in the big book and to come to your own decision about it. Is there a divine presence? That's a question, that's not an answer, but this is a portrayal of perhaps something that will help you reflect on it. This, whatever this is, by definition, this it, capital I, this it is infinite. This reality, this power, this other or greater than myself, this creator, to use another word with the capital C as a synonym. It has to have no beginning and no end. It has to be infinite by definition. Otherwise, where did it come from? Who made it? We can only push it so far back. And then the mystery reveals itself as mystery. Not that we understand it, but we can talk about it this way. Is this reality like a fish in water? This will take you someplace in a meditation. Think about a fish in water. A fish doesn't even know it's in water, but it can't survive without being in the water. The fish is not the water but it can't survive if it's not in the water. It's a wonderful metaphor for this power. It has its limitations though, because it implies the fish and water as two elements that are separate and independent. I much prefer the wave in the ocean. Think about that one. This wave might be a tsunami. Let's assume it is. It came out of the sea. It's 300 feet high and it lasts for three weeks rolling across the ocean, someplace to be destructive, someplace else, or just to dissipate its energy. It doesn't matter. But for three weeks, this wave has risen out of the ocean. This wave is not the ocean. It is a wave with a specific identity. It's 300 feet tall and it lasts for three weeks. This wave is not the ocean, but this wave is not, not the ocean. I'm going to back to page 53 now. 
And then I'll come back to the illustrations, the PowerPoint illustrations. Page 53. When we became alcoholics crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. Step one, self-imposed crisis. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else God is nothing. God either is or God isn't. What is our choice? We are confronted with the question of faith. All right. I've brought you up to that point now with my review of what we did in depth last week. It says we can't duck the issue. He uses this wonderful image. We, we walked a long ways over the bridge of reason. Do you notice that there's a capital B and a capital R there? I can't believe that Bill means that to be a synonym for God. That makes no sense because he says that's inadequate. The outlines and the promise of the new land. Now that's a synonym for that power, capital N, capital L. That's where we want to be. The bridge of reason is what we've used in order to, and I'm using it right now. I told you I was appealing to your mind for discernment. Friendly hands had stretched out in welcome. We were grateful that reason, capital R again, but I believe Bill has tongue in cheek here, had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore with our mind. Perhaps we had been leaning too heavily on reason, our mind as a God, with a small g, as a metaphor, as a synonym. That last mile, we did not like to lose our support. Think about Indiana Jones in one of those Temple of Doom movies where he's at the edge of a large precipice and he has to get someplace to solve the mystery. And he doesn't know how he's going to get from the precipice that he's at right now across to where he needs to be to solve the solution of the movie's story. And he just literally moves his feet as if he's going to step out into the precipice and that glass floor emerges, right? It's wonderful. That's that act of faith. That's that leap of faith of the existentialists of the 19th century. A leap of faith. This is that decision that we're making. A faith decision with no evidence and no feeling. And we've made the decision to live according to it. Bill has a great respect for feelings, page 54. We found that we too had been worshipers, a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring, bring on, had we not variously worshipped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves. You see, he's literally putting down feelings here. He's saying we're, we're, we're distracted by feelings as if they're the solution. And even with better motives, we have this wonderful emotion at a sunset and, and the sea and or a flower. And love, love of people, all of the emotion and infatuation that goes with that. And then he says in a wonderful perspective here, these feelings, these loves, these worships have nothing to do with pure reason but they're the tissue out of which our lives were constructed. Wow, what an insight, especially for us addicts. The tissue, feelings, the tissue out of which our lives are constructed, these feelings determine the course of our existence. Amen. So then he gets a little bit salesy here. He tries to use some logic. 
Are we going to abandon science or does science in fact itself have some faith involved about electrons and he gets into it. I'm not going to. You read it. Page 55. We're looking for spiritual liberation here to rise above our problems. And then he's saying, appealing to the agnostic and the atheist who are skeptical when they hear about God. He said they only these atheists and agnostics, they tolerate us. They only smile when we say God made this possible. And yet, he says in that last sentence on page 55, that top paragraph, hadn't we seen spiritual release? Hadn't we seen spiritual release? That's what the community and the fellowship is all about. A witness to the effectiveness of this process. Not only do they get free of their addiction, the majority of people in the, in the room, but they also have empowered to, to manage their lives, their finances, their relationships, their work, their friends, their lives. They're not being dominated by the bedevilments any longer. And now he's going to get a little bit, oh, Salesy and logic at the same time. Deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. That's very often misquoted or misunderstood when quoted. The fundamental idea of God is not the God idea. Very different. My idea of God has no bearing on the actual reality of God. The difference between my idea of God and the God idea is diametric at the opposite ends. Of course, he refers to calamity and pomp and worship, mir miracles even, all right? Lots of people base their faith on external happenings. Some people base their lack of faith on external happenings. How can you explain the Auschwitz genocide if there is a loving God? Yeah. Philosophers have struggled with this for five to 10,000 years of writing. The problem of evil. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was part of our makeup. Most civilizations, most societies, all of history, people of all cultures and traditions have had some type of a faith, especially in a power other than themselves and have represented it in a variety of ways. We were asked on page 45, two questions. <clears throat> I'm gonna to get to it here in a minute. I know what the questions are, but I want to be very clear here. On page 45, he says at the uh, end of the first full paragraph, the paragraph that begins lack of power, that is my dilemma. I have to find a power by which I could live. Notice I've, I've, I've made that point before, by which I could live, not by which I can deal effectively with my addiction, but by which I could live, that is manage my life, be empowered to deal with reality as it is. Oh, well, obviously. And then the question here it is, where and how are we going to find this power? There's two questions there, where? And now, this is on page 45. We're now on page 55, and he's going to answer the question. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. Okay, 
He's telling us how to find God. Search fearlessly. God is as much a fact as we are. We found the great reality, capital G, capital R, again, synonyms, deep down within us. Oh, that's the answer to the question, where? Deep down within us. And then he nails it. He doesn't just leave it there deep down within us. He says, in the last analysis, it is only there that God can be found. It is, with, it is so with us. It is only there in the last analysis. It's after, after all the books we read, after all the discussions we have, after all the thinking that we have, after we have finished with all our talk and all our reading and all our analysis, that's where we end up. Bill has expressed his training in English language in many different places. And what he says is, I was taught never to be redundant. I was taught never to use the same words in consecutive sentences. So when he does use some redundancy, it's because he's using it with tremendous intent to get our attention. He only does it a couple times based on my awareness of the big book. But here it is. He has just said the answer to the questions where and how. And now he's going to repeat similar words, different instructions, using somewhat the same language. We can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice. Does that echo the set-aside attitude? Our testimony, that is, we're, we're standing as a witness. He is writing this book. He has a committee of group conscience that's vetting this book and his writing on it. And they're endorsing his experience as their experience. That's what he means here. Our testimony. Enables you to think honestly. Again, this is how to find God. He gave us words above. Search fearlessly. Here it's think honestly. Search fearlessly. A, 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 a verb that comes out of our will to take action. Think honestly, a verb that comes out of, or adverb, that comes out of our ability in our mind to think. Encourages you to search diligently. Oh, again, that's how. Search fearlessly, search diligently. Then he says again, within yourself, he's reinforcing it. That's where. Then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. Capital B, capital H. What a great image that is. It prompted me in my meditation when I was writing my book on meditation for Hazleton three years ago. To come with the phrase, it was a gift of that meditation. The journey is the destination because there's no place to go. If God is everything, then God is everywhere. There, one of the mystics of the 16th century said, there is no place that there is not God. God is closer to me than I am to myself, a different mystic. A different mystic. In between me and God, there is no between. A different mystic. God is closer to me than I am to myself. A different mystic. God is closer to me than my very breath. And when you think about the origin of the word spirit, it comes from the Greek spiros. And that word spiros, S-P-I-R-O-S, means breath. There's a connection here. If you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. 
With this attitude, you cannot fail. Wow. Well, what do you mean, Bill? Attitude. What's the attitude? I don't recall you connecting the dots here. So I have to rethink it. What's an attitude? Well, it's a stance and you, you can almost get a picture of somebody with their hand on their hip kind of in a defiant mode. You know, that person has attitude. All right. But then I, I, I thought about when I was reviewing this back in um, 1995, actually. I recalled the, my sponsor had a boat and he was a sailor. It was a sailboat, a big, large one. And he talked about attitude, the attitude of the mast and the sail. The attitude of the mast and the sail had to be particularly positioned to catch the wind to empower the boat. My God, that's a powerful metaphor. My attitude will catch the spirit to give me the power to move forward. Attitude. Well, what does he mean? Maybe it's, maybe it's search fearlessly, think honestly, search diligently. Two functions of the will, one function of the mind. Search diligently, search fearlessly. Acts of my will to take action. Think honestly an act of my mind to be transparent. To be courageous in everything. You cannot fail. And then he says, the consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. There's a second step promise. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Bill likes that metaphor of the broad highway. You might want to take a look on your own time on page 75 at the promises at the end of step five. He says, we feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. You want to have a meditation, take that one apart and chew on it. We feel we are on the broad highway, capital B, capital H, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. There's a partnership here. There's a collaboration here. There's a cooperation here. There's a communication here. For the assignment for next week, I would like you very much to read chapter four again. This will be the third time. From the perspective of positive and with a third color highlighter, read with a Third color highlighter in your hand and highlight anything that resonates with you that you agree with, that is positive. That you resonate with. In contrast to the first reading where you read just generally what struck you. The second reading was looking at from a de, uh, uh, the, the, the point of view of the agnostic, the atheist, the doubter, the negative. And now with a third color looking with the third question, and that is, what do I agree with? What do I resonate with? What helps me expand my consciousness about this reality? this power other than or greater than or higher than myself. Also uh, read, because we haven't finished Bill's story, read the balance of Bill's story, pages nine through 16. That's item five in assignment six. I've held it back until this point because I think there's very little reading to do other than to complete the reading of the chapter which is also part of assignment number eight to finish the assignment uh, of uh, pages uh, 55, 56, and 57. And then uh, read uh, Bill's story 
the 9 through 16, because that's his conversion experience. And you'll note on page 13, his working the six steps of the Oxford group on his second day of hospitalization. And then on page 14, his uh, spiritual experience, his mountaintop experience. On page 14. And you might want to reread Appendix 2, which has been referred to a couple times in Chapter 4. We looked at it deeply, I hope deeply enough, for you to understand spiritual awakening, spiritual experience. But it's been a while. It's been five months since we looked at it. You might want to review the Appendix 2 of Spiritual Experience, Spiritual Awakening on page 567 and 568. And as I mentioned earlier, the final piece for this assignment for next week is for you to identify the word and or phrase about the choice that you're making, the decision that you're making about what you need and want this power to be, the attributes and qualities. Each one of these words I'm using with laser focus and intent. I hope you're capturing these words. What do you want? What do you need? In attributes and qualities. If you don't know what attributes means, look it up. As a higher power. As I mentioned earlier, step two is a decision about God. That's all it is. There's no commitment here other than exploring what you need and what you want at this time. If you're brand new, it might be uh, a healer. If you've had some time and you're five or 10 or 20 years down the road, it might be some other form of concept. I've used so many different ones. My concept of God changes as I do. Five years ago, I was really embracing the term mystery, because at that point, it was really too vague for me. So I just used the word mystery with a capital M. Prior to that, I had used it for the very same reason. In the last couple of years, and I think you've heard me say this, I'm using the word flow. I've used the word reality with a capital R. Currently, I'm using that word flow with a capital F. It has different meanings and different connotations to me as my consciousness develops. I'm hoping it's growing. It's certainly developing. <laughs> so it's... To complete assignment eight, you might want to reread them specifically. I don't want to take your time or mine to go over them in any more detail than that. Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk, died in 1968. One of my teachers out of his books so God is that reality that has no circumference and whose center is everywhere. That's why I teased you maybe a little bit last time, last week, to look up the words imminent. Maybe tease is the wrong word, challenge you, invited you. That's a better word, invited you to look up the word imminence and transcendence. There are $100 spiritual terms, theological terms, actually, but they give you the flavor of what we're talking about here. Bill had these concepts. On page uh, 14 at the top, he says, simple but not easy. A price has to be paid. It means the destruction of self-centeredness. That's all about that unmanageability. And then he says, we must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us all. That's a concept of transcendence. That's what Thomas Merton meant by there is no circumference. 
He also says on page 46, the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. Bill was a mystic in, 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 this, in, in this awareness, in, in, in a poet anyway. The spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, page 46. That's the imminence. That's what Merton is implying when he says its center is everywhere. These are beyond our ability to comprehend. I'm not saying I understand anything of what I'm saying. I'm mouthing it. All right. I have a connection to what I consider to be the truth of it. But there's no firm knowledge here. There's certainly no science here. I, I, I try to avoid having much attachment or feeling to it. I'm trying to elevate my consciousness and my awareness to the vastness of this reality. Again, I'll, I'll repeat Thomas Merton's comments because they're, they're profound and they're worthy of meditation. God is that reality that has no circumference and whose center is everywhere. See, based on reflection on that, God doesn't come and go. There's no absence or presence of God. That's why Bill wonderfully in his accuracy of his English language use says in step 11 to improve our conscious contact. You see, in step two, we're establishing conscious contact, maybe for the first time. In step two, we're establishing conscious contact. And in step three, we're making a decision to have a relationship, a conscious relationship. With that contact. And in step 11, we're improving our conscious contact. We never lose contact. It's an existential reality, according to Bill. I'm a big word, but it just means that there is no place that there is not God. The person who put my slides together uh, is 40 years sober, and she is a commercial artist and took my workshop three different times and has created my PowerPoints to reflect the teaching that I'm trying to make. So this is the reality that I believe we're coming to here as the result of my interpretation of the big book and my experience with the process. Transcendent is the circle that encompasses all of reality. That triangle is the human being, that's each individual. That triangle is the human being, each individual. And we're all encompassed in that. But the spirit is deep down inside us and that's the imminence. The spirit is all around us. The spirit is deep down inside of us. Notice how she put that. I'm going to play it again. Look at the bottom of the screen. I just love that. She did it without telling me, and I was in a presentation, and I hit the button again, and spirit everywhere. I just love that. I mean, it has meaning to me, and it might not have to you, but it certainly reinforces what we're talking about in terms of spiros and the breath. This is the model that we're talking about here. I'm trying to mm, unpack Bill's perception. He said, we can find this power deep down inside of us when we search diligently, when we search fearlessly, when we think honestly. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come. And... Uh, by the way, I became very conscious as I've 
finished uh, my deliberation and commentary on the material from the big book that I, I probably need to say very clearly that some of that is not, my interpretation is not uh, uh, out of the big book and it's mm, really my experience, my interpretation, sometimes my opinion. And so if anything that you heard doesn't jive with your understanding of the big book, you need to talk to your sponsor about the, your uh, concern. And um, the big book is always right. All right, the big book is always right. Uh, my interpretation is my interpretation. So I just wanted to, a little disclaimer there because sometimes I speak very authoritatively and uh, you might get the idea that it's gospel and it's not. <laughs> it's just Herb Kagan's interpretation of the big book and experience with it. So thank you for your broad understanding and acceptance of that. Think about the wave in the ocean. And I, this is so significant. I will say it again. The wave is not the ocean. Okay. But the wave is not, not the ocean. I am not God. I'm very clear. But I am not, not God. Right. Yeah. That's good. It is. It's excellent. It's really good. <laughs> Let's end with that on the embrace okay. that serenity prayer. And we'll unpack that a little bit more next week. So God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Thanks, everybody. It's a very robust meeting tonight. Thank you for your involvement and your sharing and your challenges. All good stuff.